Hello once again, Star Wars and Unboxing fans. Welcome to another episode of Darth Tuba's Star Wars Unboxing Show, Shelf Talk. And right here with my buddy Vader, we have kind of a unique shelf. Now I've done, if you look on previous Shelf Talk, Talk episodes, I have done episodes where we've talked a little bit about some of the carded figures I have here, okay? And by the way, if you look closely at these, you'll know that they are not vintage carded figures. I do have a small collection of those as well. These are the new vintage collection. Uh, when I say new, I mean new like as in 10 years ago. Um, and then coming from there, they've started bringing them back and they're continuing the line and that's great and all. So this is where I have them kept and I kind of starting to find places throughout the collection. But what I wanted to talk about today was some of the less displayable shelf talk items like books and other kind of media. And I think that that's a neat thing to kind of display as well because for all the toys and collectible items that, that find themselves on shelves and displayed in dioramas, there is a ton of media, we'll call it media information, that uh, is available to collectors. Now I will say this, I am not one to keep, I'm not too fond of keeping every single piece of printed material about Star Wars. I did for a while, but life gets in the way. It's just too hard to do. So I had to make some choices. But right now, this is where things lie. I think I'll talk about, where are we? Here and here. So we'll talk about these top two shelves. We'll get to the lower shelves on another day. Okay, but, and I'm not gonna take every little tiny little bit out. I'm just gonna kinda do a sampling. Um, some things that have uh, kinda stuck out to me. First, we got some CDs, okay? This is a, an awesome CD collection. This is from 1993. This is the Star Wars Trilogy. Now, this is the original trilogy. I believe it's a... I want to say it's a four... I meant to do that. <laughs> I want to say it's a four-disc set, but it actually might be a, an eight-disc set. Um, pardon me as some of the discs. What was really cool about it is it came with a really cool booklet, all nifty stuff about Star Wars and about John Williams. And I think... Now, most of these are not in here. I have a, I have a stereo unit that has everything kind of put in there, but... Um, Trying to see if they were. It looks like they're all single discs, so it's a four disc set. But the fourth disc is actually all outtakes, things that were never originally released. So that's pretty cool. Okay. And uh, later on, when um, they released, I believe it on DVD, and I think this was in uh, yeah 2004, we got the another box set. Okay. And that's what you just heard come crashing down. And, uh, you know, again, new art. And I do believe there was a couple of um, new tack, new uh, tracks, or at least some that were just kind of collected, like A New Hope. Yeah, they were all double discs, okay? So there, so between these two sets, okay, between the, um, the 2004 and the 1993, I do believe you can, uh, you can come across um, pretty much all released original trilogy material. Now, of course, I am not by any means an expert. So you need to understand that. And, and, and not being an expert, I can tell you that you can talk to all sorts of soundtrack advice columns. There are podcasts about it. There are all sorts of places where you can go and look and find amazing, knowledgeable people, more, much more than me, about the kinds of soundtracks you can get. Um, personally, I, I, I focus mainly on collecting soundtracks that you heard from the films themselves. However, you can find recordings of other famous orchestras, New York Philharmonic, Prague Orchestra, all over the world doing recordings of a lot of the Star Wars music, and you might enjoy that. You might enjoy the different takes that different conductors have on the material. Sometimes it's John Williams conducting those orchestras, so it's pretty cool. So keep an eye on that. All right, so you might also see here, you get some DVDs, okay? Now the DVDs, well, what kind of DVDs we have? Now, honestly, I'm not a big DVD collector. I'm not someone, in fact, I just did a yard sale where I dumped a ton of my DVDs. Why? Because so much of it's available in streaming now. And I am a lazy person in that sense. I'm like, I would be much more inclined to just go stream it there, great. It's on Netflix, great. It's on iTunes, I can buy it for four bucks, great. Uh, then I have it there. But there are some things that right now you can't get. For example, The Clone Wars, the cartoon, Jendi Tartakovsky, Clone Wars, volumes one and two. Very important. And will I keep them forever? Who knows? Because even the streaming service coming from Disney might have all this. But the thing about streaming services that I'm not 100% sold on is that they bring things in and they come and go. 
See, I like something comes and then it stays there, okay? Something is comes into the forefront of media and then it doesn't go. It stays forever. But look at what Netflix does. They have new things that come every month and old things that go out. So that's why I'll probably hold on to things until I know for sure. Um, we have, of course, the uh, Ewoks cartoon. And this was actually a, uh, a double feature. This was something that I think is an official loose, an official release thing. It's hard to watch the Ewoks cartoon, but it's every, every now and then. My daughter enjoyed it, so I have a sentimental attachment to it. And speaking of Ewoks, we also have the Battle of Endor, okay? Let me tell you something. As a kid, I was really, really into these because it was Star Wars on TV. It was live-action Star Wars before there was live-action Star Wars. And yes, it was only Ewoks, and you know, as a, as a, a pubescent young lad watching uh, Ewoks after Return of the Jedi came out, I wasn't like immensely thrilled but I didn't dislike it either you know and I and any kind of hint any sound effect anything that was even somewhat related to the Star Wars movies I was all over so the Ewok Caravan of Courage actually it's two movies Battle for Endor and Car Caravan of Courage by the way if you're gonna watch this with your children you might want to watch the first one and then not watch the second one or give them a strict talking to because it was my first time experiencing the fact that something that ends happily in one movie the next movie can start off by just throwing the first movie all under the bus. So be careful. Um, the story of Star Wars, this is actually something that I think Walmart delivered. It was like a half an hour thing where they kind of went through the whole thing, with the whole trilogy. And I think it was pre, it came out around 2002. It was kind of a precursor to episode two. Um, and, and those kind of things, it's kind of cool just to, just to get an understanding of this. You could probably find a lot of this on eBay if you look hard enough. Okay, and then, you know, I wouldn't be... I wouldn't be a true fan, I feel, if I don't at least subscribe to some fan films. Um, and, you know, and I went around to a uh, convention and there was a guy selling a whole bunch of fan films. And this was Star Trek... Con or Star Trek... My bad. Excuse me. Star Wars Contract of Evil. Um, are they great? Sometimes they're great. I mean, it's amazing the artistry that, that some people have and are, are able to put on a film when you consider that they have zero budget, that they're just volunteering their time. So there's some cool stuff there. But it is also kind of, you know, you, you can see where things aren't working all, all that well. Sometimes the acting isn't that great. Sometimes some of the effects are great. You can see where they put their, whatever money they did put towards effects, you can see in certain shots and not in other shots. It's okay. You know, you can be, I'm very forgiving of that. I'm very supportive of that. It's just fans showing their love for Star Wars. Um, if you haven't seen this, R2-D2 Beneath the Dome, see it now a lot of this stuff you can probably find on youtube but this is a mockumentary i believe it was directed by um ben burt and it's about 20 minutes but it, they interview lucas they interview francis ford coppola they all these people all about r2 being kind of like how he his rise to stardom as if he's an actual sentient being and what happens after that where he falls from grace and that kind of thing so it's pretty neat some more short films Okay, again, a lot of these you can get on YouTube now, so I don't even know. I might look at them, look through them. Some anime. This is like a whole series of people's animated films. And I told you Ewoks before. Here's Droids. Um, you know, I, I liked Droids a little bit better than I liked Ewoks, so that's kind of cool to have that. All right, and then I'm not going to take all the stuff down, but, you know, I, this is where I keep my CDs. Here's the Attack of the Clone. Here's the Clone Wars movie. Great. Trotter Trio sketches on Star Wars. If you like jazz, approaching progressive jazz, they take a lot of, you know, a lot of John Williams music really, really went to town. And even though it sounds very symphonic with the way it is being played with an orchestra, it's actually very rooted in jazz. Jazz harmonies, you know, jazz progressions. So um, it's fun to hear a jazz trio play that. This, of course, is the ultimate fandom menace, fa fandom menace, phantom menace. To get a chance to find this one, I highly recommend it. A lot of people considered the phantom menace to be one of John Williams' greatest works. Um, and when you hear that version, the ultimate -er version, you are hearing the entire movie beginning to end. See, when, when a soundtrack is released for a movie, whether it's John Williams or any other composer, they typically set it up in an album format that's out of order to the movie. It, it might have some beats that are similar, but essentially it's really more in a symphonic order that might work better work better as a listening device to listen to the piece you know the pieces together and how they would relate to each other front to back this version was basically every drop of music every note of music that you heard for the most part from beginning to end in that order 
So that's pretty cool. It's a little different take on it. It also includes, if you're, those who remember around then, 20 years ago, they, they released a kind of music video that had a dialogue and scenery and scenes from the movie doing Duel of the Fates. And it includes that soundtrack version of that, which actually was released on like pop, top 40 albums, you can, or top 40 radio stations. You can actually hear, you know, you'd hear Michael Jackson and the next thing you know, you'd hear Duel of the Fates. So it's kind of cool. So there you go with that. Now, of course, if you look closely, you might see the complete Glenn Miller recordings. Okay, that's obviously not Star Wars, but hey, Darth Tuba, those who don't know me probably know that when I'm not talking about Star Wars, my career is music. I'm a music teacher and uh, I study lots of different styles of music and people ask me what's my favorite kind of music. I really don't like to give an answer because there's a ton of music out there. And my, my playlists on my iPhone are, they run rampant, okay? Everything from rock to jazz to blues to country to show tunes to opera to classical to movie soundtracks, you know, all sorts of stuff. And big band. I love big band music. So, all right. And let's see. So more of these. We have The Empire Strikes Back and Star Wars radio dramas. We have Shadows of the Empire. Uh, we have a few other, like a Boston Pops take on it. So some cool stuff there. All right. And I'm going to move these, this out of the way. And what else we got here? We got a couple of other things here. We got some books. We got some... Some little golden books. This is a fairly new one. Uh, I am a Wookiee. <laughs> for those who don't remember, a little golden books. A very big thing for young people growing up. We have the Jedi Academy, which are which is like a young readers thing. We have the Rebel Journal. I don't collect all of these. I do kind of come across things from time and again. Uh, some of these are new. I'm going to actually move a lot of these. We got some. What else we got? We got some comics, um, like uh, you know DJ Most Wanted. We have a solo comic, okay? A lot of mishmash. Um, got a Lando comic. Um, I have kept this um, every now and then. If a celebrity passes away, I and, and People Magazine does a nice little whole magazine devoted, I often will pick that up for Carrie Fisher, of course. Some Insider, Star Wars Insider magazines, okay? I don't often keep them forever. Um, a lot of times I'll keep them for a while, and then we'll sell them off as a, as a bulk. Um, you know, not, not for any main reason, just because. I do like to keep some packaging from Star Wars. This is like a chewy candy. These are uh, string cheese bat packages. And then these are some things that I really enjoy. Uh, let's see if I can show you these from, from that angle. Uh, I picked up three of these. These are aprons. But these are aprons... As you can see, it's a Jedi apron. And these were not available to the public. These were, I believe, I want to say Pizza Hut had them. Um, this is really, you can see these are not meant to be collectibles. Okay? And I'm looking and I don't see, but I do believe it was, I do believe it was um, Pizza Hut. I do believe it's an episode one thing. So, I always thought those were pretty cool. And in addition to that, it's hard to make out, but this one is a Darth Maul version of that. And this one is a Queen Amidala version of that. So, you know, it's just like the head cut off. Kind of a cool, um, unique take on stuff. And when, let me tell you, when all the Star Wars stuff was coming out in the, early, in the late 90s for Episode 1, especially because it was such a juggernaut of, of stuff, I was always looking for the things that weren't as popular. What are the things that you don't see too much of? And that was not something available to the public. So I was able to secure that elsewhere. Okay, we have a nice... Uh, Episode 3, when the uh, M&M characters did a crossover, so it was a nice little tin. Um, I forget what was in here. I think there was bags of M&M chocolates, so that's kind of cool. And, you know, I, I, I kind of like to keep tins like that for any little tiny knickknacks that come, in, come my way. Good place to put them. I have found myself... Oh, what do we got here? Oh, we have a... Whoa! There's a cool book called Dressing the Galaxy. Great costume book. Great. This is obviously for um, the prequels. Great if you are looking for reference pictures to do your own cosplaying. Really, really good stuff. And you can probably find used books fairly cheap. More Star Wars Insiders. Um, a couple more. Yeah, this is basically some, some still shots. I mean, again, a lot of it's, you know, stuff that I've come across just going to a convention and they have people have free stuff on the table and you just grab what you grab and that's what you do. Um, 
So what else we got here? We got some lenticular, ooh, a lenticular, looks like a poster, but it's Target. I think it's an episode two thing. Build the Red Clone Army, or might be, no, actually it might be uh, Clone Wars. We've got um, a TV guide, Star Wars with an exclusive CD-ROM, go figure. Um, kind of the ultimate achievement, McDonald's Happy Meal boxes with, um, I guess this was, I don't remember which season this was. Well, this one was from, yeah, they're both from the Clone Wars, but this one focused on Clone Wars. This one focused on the movies a little more. So, pretty cool. You know, a little snapshot of time. Kind of a nostalgic throwback. Um, oh, stamps. These are, these are stamp, you know, United States postal stamps that came out which are really cool. Uh, what else we got? We have <laughs> an Apple Dippers bag. Who knows? It's a lot of it. I'm telling you. Level of passion is what separates collector and hoarder. Or maybe I'm going to interrupt there for a minute. All right. So next up we've got, um, I have this scrapbook that I've just been using. It has, it's funny. Like This stuff is, are, you know, newspaper clippings. And I don't want to get too into this, but I mean... You know, it just shows stuff from, here's a picture of Luke from back in the 80s, okay? This is a lot of Return of the Jedi stuff. Okay, so, you know, I've been, not just, just to show, this isn't something new. This isn't something I've been focusing on uh, just in the last five or ten years. So, I guess in some ways when I, you know, everybody, uh, it's funny, like everybody, yeah, here's the Return of the Jedi Ewoks. And there's just lots of cool stuff about the Ewok adventure. It was just a nice little way to kind of keep track of everything, you know? So that's why it's funny when I, when I see people that are, you know, putting on very good content or very well put together content about Star Wars and their fandom and how they enjoy things. When they put that out there, okay, and I see that, I, I respect it. But at the same time, I see this person who might be in their mid-20s and who have the technical, technical know-how being digital first language, that they can do this. And that's great. But they don't have the knowledge, necessarily. They don't have it inherited in their in their psyche because they weren't there. You know, they inherited it later. But hey, I love old 40s and 50s movies. And I love, you know, some historical things of that nature. And I wasn't around for them. So you can be a fan without having been there. But it's just interesting when people get very heated in their opinions, but they weren't there. So it's hard to fully grasp that but nonetheless an opinion is an opinion and you're right you have your right to it that's all right and of course here i have a blank notebook which i will not keep there anymore because i need space so all right so we've gone through a lot of that over down here in the bottom um i'm just going to take out one but there's a whole series of the old tv guides there's some lenticulars i do love collecting the tv guides particularly the old ones um just because you know this was in the heat of their you know episode one episode two episode three they had their series of collectible, you know, collect all four, collect all six, collect all eight, whatever. And uh, I did like the old TV guide. I don't like the new full-size TV guide. I understand why they did it. I'm just not a big fan. And I do believe TV guide is slowly becoming obsolete with streaming and everything that's getting much more popular. So it's kind of a snapshot in time. So I don't mind that. Also, we have <laughs> some old Return of the Jedi books. The Ewoks Join the Fight. Chewbacca's Activity Book. Luke Skywalker's activity book. The Mystery of the Rebellious Robot. The Maverick Moon. And R2-D2's activity book. There's some pretty cool stuff in here. So I've, I've always enjoyed all, uh, you know, having those uh, kind of things. Oh, now. Anyone who was, grew up in the late 70s and 80s remember pop-up books, okay? Pop-up books, for you know, I'm sure you've all seen them. I'm sure they still have them. But they are just the kind of three-dimensional things. Now they have, like, greeting cards that do this. You know, the, the pop-up technology has gotten a lot better. So it's amazing to see. But sometimes it was just ways that you interacted with the book, okay? Pre-computers, this was pre-tech. This was tech. This was tech for the 80s. So, um, you know, turn this, and you can see, if you turn this, you see how he's able to activate the saber. And, and you know, it's pretty cool what they were able to do. And, you know, it, it sparked your imagination, you know? Here's Yoda. So, love that kind of stuff. So, I have, I believe I have all three of them at some point. We have Star Wars Blueprints, which I actually have a large book 
that in, that contains the actual blueprints. These are more like theatrical blueprints. There's actual blueprints, which are really cool. Um, my, my 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 mentor, the the uh, I, I would say the Yoda to my Padawan, me being a Padawan, is the author Stephen J. Sansweet, who runs Rancho Obi Wan. Stephen Sansweet. I hope you get a catch this, the, this episode. Um, somebody made a suggestion that I reach out to you about getting together to formulate a Rancho Obi-Wan East. If that's ever something you want to talk about, I don't think I even hold a candle even coming close to you. But if you do want to talk about doing something, I am all ears to at least listen to it. But he wrote many, many books about collectibles. Um, these thousand collectibles, just basically like snapshots of really cool things, really cool items. Okay. Great book if you can get it. Um, a lot of fun stuff in there. Okay. Uh, what else we got? Oh, so speaking of staying sweet. Uh, actually, no, this is a different, not staying sweet. Uh, from Star Wars to Indiana Jones, the best of the Lucasfilm archives. The essential guide to planets and moons. Uh, the illustrated Star Wars universe, art by Ralph McQuarrie, the man, the myth, the legend. Okay, we have also, these are some things that we've done on previous episodes. Here are the books for the buildable, um, little wooden build kits that we've done, the Millennium Falcon, the X-Wing, and R2. So this is the rest of the book. Remember, that wasn't just a building book. That was um, that was a, like an, an informational book. So that was pretty cool. And there's another one for a TIE Fighter. And then we have some things here like Catalyst. Whoops, sorry. A Rogue One novel. Great book if you want a prequel to Rogue One. <laughs> the Princess Diarist, not for kids. Oh my goodness not for kids great book this uh, i believe carrie fisher wrote two kind of semi-autographical books um one of them well actually more than that but um the two most notable in the in in more recent years was the princess diarist which um was pure carrie fisher humor uh, self-deprecating humor a lot of fun to read a lot of a little sad to read okay but it has a lot of humor in it this also has a lot of humor in it, but it's a little bit more uncomfortable because it's actually a part of her diary and it tells what was going on in her head during her Star Wars years, among other years. And it was, it, 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 can, it can be tough. It can be tough. Definitely not a book for kids. All right, but an interesting nonetheless. All right, so we're going to wrap things up a little bit here. Oops, these new TV guides. Doing great. This is a great Star Wars trilogy book, okay? There have been several that have come out. This is, came out on the 10th anniversary, 87. Um, I do enjoy Easter egg kits, Easter egg coloring kits. So I do not usually break into them too much. So there's been a whole bunch every year. There's been a few. Um, so I just kind of enjoy seeing how they kind of upgrade them year after year, and they don't take up that much room. All right, and what else we got? We got, well, speaking of Easter egg kits, we've got the ones that are like the actual cups. All right. And again, some of these things are things that I kind of look at and say, oh, they're really cool. And then like later on, I'm like, why do I have this? And they find their way to a yard sale. So I'm not overly attached to all that stuff. Okay. We've got the Return of the Jedi. Return of the Jedi radio drama, which I'm actually going to put up here because it's going to find its way up there. I think, are these cassettes? Let me look here. Yep, these are cassettes, unfortunately. But I have been able to find the Return of the Jedi uh, one online. So, they'll, you know, those are probably never going to be played again. I'll probably sell them in a in a future sale of some sort. And as I said, speaking of Star Wars Insiders, whole pile of Insider Star Wars Insider magazines. Great to have. Awesome to have. Um, I am starting to lose my affection for... Uh, magazine print media because very simply it takes up a lot of room and all this information can be found re reproduced in um, digital form so it's kind of hard for me to eventually these things have to kind of something has to give again a finite amount of space but there's more than that you can see there's more insiders down here there's a whole box here okay that has a lot of printed media so Wrapping things up, this is an old uh, episode one toy catalog, which I think I showed in a previous episode. Uh, we've got the Paradise Snare cassette with no box. I don't know where the box went. Uh, New Jedi Order, um, 
Vector Prime. So pretty cool stuff there. Vector Prime, I think, is where uh, they take out Chewbacca in the Expanded Universe. Okay, so some pretty cool stuff there. And yeah, there are some occasional Star Trek things that find their way in here. Don't, 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 don't hate me. Okay, because I am one of those can't we all get along type people. All right, a lot of the books that were Expanded Universe, I never really kept. I do enjoy the um, Catalyst book. I'll probably end up not keeping it though. But there are some books that have rereadable potential. This is one of them, Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Basically was said to be a potential sequel to Star Wars, the first movie, episode four, when Lucas was not sure if that movie was going to be a hit. If it wasn't a hit, then he might have been able to make this into a TV type movie. So we had the book. But then the, then the movie was a massive hit and they said, well, we got to go in a different direction. Tales from Jabba's Palace, Tales from the Moss Eisley Canteen, or no, Tales of the Bounty Hunters, and Tales from the Empire, and it's not there. Oh, there it is. Ah. Tales from the Mouse Eisley Cantina. If you are a short attention span person and you need some, something to help kind of move things along, the Tales books are awesome. They are so much fun. They basically take the... It, there's a new book that came out from a certain point of view, 40 Star Wars stories to celebrate the 40th anniversary, and it basically went through the entire Star Wars story, but told it from different perspectives of different people that were watching it. That is the same idea. It's basically like Tales from the Moss Eisley Cantina will be basically what was Greedo, what was going through Greedo's mind during, what was going through Hammerhead's mind, what was going through the band's mind. And they have these little stories that kind of show how these characters ended up there and how they ended up where they went after that. You know, give or take. You know, they, they kind of vary between groups. Great stories, not long, maybe, you know, five, ten pages each. So simple reads, great. Great stuff to have. All right, wrapping things up. What other ones we have here in our novels? Well, we have the first um, biography of George Lucas, Skywalking, the life and films of George Lucas, creator of Star Wars. We have Lando Calrissian and the Flame Wind of Ocean, uh, Lando Calrissian and the Star Cave of Thon Boca, and Lando Calrissian and the Mine Harp of Sheru. And I believe Sheru and Ocean were both mentioned in Solo, which I thought was a really great cred. Okay. Nicely done. We have a nice Empire Strikes Back um, making of, like a journal making of, which is really cool. It comes with some pretty cool photos. These are some Han Solo adventures that came out back in the 70s, 80s. Han Solo at Star's End, Han Solo's Revenge, and Han Solo and the Lost Legacy. And I think lastly, besides these, this random lightsaber pen, uh, last but not least, we've got this set of DVDs. Now, I'll probably end up moving this up here. What are these DVDs? Well, these DVDs are not available to just anyone. All right? I, mean, I mean, they are available, but they're not easy to come by. Well, oh, let me get rid of this one. Robot Chicken. Real fun. Uh, I'm not one to have issues with parodies. I think parodies are great. But these are all, R these are all R2 Builders DVDs. Okay, and it's like R2 LA 3, Celebration 3 R2 Builders, Celebration 2 R2 Builders, R2 LA 2003, Michael Senna's home. Anybody who's ever heard of the name Michael Senna, I'm sure not many of you have, but Michael Senna is essentially um, an amazing engineer that has constructed um, multiple, not only multiple R2 units, but R2 units that do everything that you see them do in the movies, including holographic imagery, which is crazy. And he's also designed ways to hoist them into your cars, into vans. I mean, really cool stuff. And uh, I, for those who don't know this, I have built an R2, or at least I have mostly built an R2. I, I have it. It's standing right now. It is mostly done except for the feet are the only things. And when I mean by the feet, I mean the feet coverings. It can stand and you can push it and it can roll. I do have the tech to make it run. I do not have the knowledge to make it run. I'm actually reaching out to some of my students who are also robotic students to see if they can help me with that. And, uh, you know, we'll see if that happens. And if it does, I will be sure to document it. I will be sure to show you it when it's done. Right now, I put a blanket on it in the garage and I call it low power mode R2 from The Force Awakens. And everybody laughs and that gets a good thing. But anyway, so I've been, I use these videos as ways to just kind of see how other people do it. There's many ways you can build an R2. You can build an R2 out of anything from wood to metals, like aluminums, uh, steel, to uh, styrene, everything. And uh, that was a good way for me to get introduced to that. So that's a cool thing. So as you can see, those top two shelves, 
quite a bit of information just kind of went on a little bit lengthy, but that's to show you that it isn't all just about the pretty things you can put on the shelf and look at, okay? Um, do I have an, you know, obviously my love for printed media is limited in that, you know, I know some people would have everything on one of these things, you know, in an airtight seal ready to be, um, you know, just to be held there and not be opened up and never opened up again for fear of creasing and everything else. I'm not like that at all. None of my stuff is worth that much in terms of value um, and monetary value. It's just worth what I pay for it and what I like keeping it around for. I do occasionally will go into here and I'll grab random books and just read through some stuff again. Again, those Star Wars Tales books are awesome for that. So just some great stuff there. Now, as you can see, there's more. There's more. Oh, much more. Four more shelves first. So we'll try to get another episode in of these at a later date. But for now, that will do it for this week's episode of Darth Tupa Star Wars Unboxing Show Shelf Talk. Like, subscribe, hit the notification button, do all that stuff. Again, people that go on Instagram and Twitter, at Darth Tuba, my advice to you is to go to the links, open up YouTube, watch the videos there. I have noticed the uh, you know an uptick in viewership for my videos, almost a double uptake. So that's really cool. Let people know about the channel. Uh, like, subscribe, hit the notification, as I said. Uh, as I had, we have an upcoming Disney trip coming up, so there'll be some great video footage from there. I might try to do a live episode, okay, which I'll then eventually, you know, post after that. But um, I'm not sure when, and I don't know how. I have to see. We have a lot of other things going on on the trip, so it might just kind of come out suddenly. Otherwise, we, um, you know, we have some other kind of in the in the can episodes that we are gonna post. Try to keep posting on Wednesdays and Friday, uh, Wednesdays and Sundays. All right. So thank you so much for watching. Until next time, may the force be with you.